a little bit about the Access to Wellness uh, project. This was formerly known as our multi-system adult project. Um, so we kind of changed the name like Prince did. So we went with the Access to Wellness. Um, and the purpose of this program is to develop a strategic approach at the local level uh, for folks that are living with uh, severe persistent mental illness and also involved in multiple systems. A little bit about background. So Governor DeWine introduced this in state fiscal year 22. So we are now two years into the program. Um, initially, the program received $11 million uh, over the biennium and uh, the funds are supported by Ohio's General Assembly. These are general revenue funds that we utilize to support these folks. Um, in state, new state fiscal year, we received an extra million dollars over the biennium uh, because the program is, we're seeing really great benefits from it. And so now we have an extra, we have 12 million over the biennium. Um, at the time, we have 45 of the 50 county alcohol, drug, mental health service boards participating. Um, and the way that this program works is the allocations are made to the local um, out-of-HS boards, and then those out-of-HS boards work with behavioral health providers within their community to provide recovery supports, which we'll get to here in a second, and what that looks like. There's a couple models that are being utilized across the state. Um, county out-of-HS boards may identify a behavioral health provider to become the fiscal agent. We see that here in Franklin County. Or the MHS board remains the fiscal agent and then reimburses behavioral health providers through the allocation. This is my attempt at a map. So <laughs> um, all of the red that you'll see on here are the participating counties for the Access to Wellness Program. The white ones are not. I know some of you folks might be asking why aren't the white ones participating? I, like Bonnie, can also read minds. So, <laughs> so, yeah, go. so um, at this point in time, we've had various reasons as to why they may or may not be participating. Um, it's really been up to a couple different factors. Some are because of just workforce uh, challenges in running the program. Um, some are because they just didn't find the need within their community, and others we just don't know. So just please know that there's continued outreach to these county boards uh, to get them uh, involved. So earlier this year, we developed a website for this program in hopes that it will help educate the community, providers, and boards a little bit more. Uh, we have an interactive map. So for those of you who are um, interested in linking to your county board and the providers uh, with the access to wellness program in your community, you can go to the website. It's actually through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, type in access to wellness. The uh, link is at the end of this, so you'll have the slides and have access to it. But just a little interactive now to show you who and their contact information uh, for the program. So, a little bit more background. When we first started this program, um, we were looking at who the population would be that we're going to serve. Um, at the time, we had pretty strict requirements around um, who would be eligible for the program. And after talking with our stakeholders, some of who are in this room right now, after talking with the providers and getting feedback from the communities, we learned that oh, we probably want to look at expanding this a little bit more. So over the last two years, we've done just that. So this is, we have five eligibility criteria that we're gonna go through so you guys can see exactly who's being served with these dollars. So two or more inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations within the past 12 months and touched by one or more of the following systems. So let's start today, September 20th, you would go back to September 20th of 22 and you would be two psychiatric, inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations, not ER visits, um, but inpatient psych. And then we do the five assistants. They can be involved in one or more of these, aging, criminal justice, developmental disabilities, homelessness, and veterans. Criteria number two, 
we started finding out that access to inpatient psychiatric facilities isn't always doable, especially in more rural communities. And where there's more private psychiatric hospitals, sometimes that doesn't always work out in uh, the individual's favor. So we needed to look at how do we incorporate crisis stabilization units into this? Because a lot of our folks are ending up in a crisis stabilization unit, um, either in lieu of inpatient psychiatric hospitalization or in lieu of incarceration too. So we're trying to find stabilization for them. So we added that as well. So two or more, just like the inpatient psychiatric hospitalization over the last 12 months, and then touched by one or more of the following systems. Just a, just a real quick thing here before I move on. Some of these are on a spectrum, right? Some of these systems involved in are on a spectrum. Some are fairly black and white. So aging over 65, clear cut. Criminal justice, we are cut. But when we get to homelessness, we're talking about folks that are couch surfing, that are, are all the way to living on the street, in a shelter, and so forth. So it can look very different for some folks. In some of the situations, we've even considered threat of eviction. So for folks who have uh, been threatened with eviction, there's been some cases where we've had boarding situations. <laughs> and eviction has been threatened, so we've needed to do some remediation with uh, the landlord to make sure they stay out. And then veterans, of course. Number three, we wanted to blend up because we know that sometimes some folks only have one inpatient psychiatric hospitalization and then they have one CSU stay. So instead of saying, well, you have to be so severe to have one or the other, we're gonna blend the two. So they can have one in each and an involvement with the system. So over the last year, a lot of conversations have happened around Senate Bill 2 and outpatient competency restoration programs across the state. Something that we started to see as a benefit to folks that are being served through this program is if courts know that an individual is involved in this program and getting the supports they need for successful community living and tenure, maybe they can get into an outpatient community treatment program, restoration program, and avoid that inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. So what we've been able to do is provide recovery supports to these folks who are actively involved in an outpatient competency restoration program within their community. And so they can stay within their community, recover in their community, and have tenure. Um, hospitalization, CSU stays, and all that system involvement has been waived for this one. We already know that they have a mental illness, severe persistent mental illness, and they're already involved with the criminal justice system, put it together, and that's an eligibility criteria. So they do have to have a significant amount of diagnosis by a licensed profession. And again, with our jail population. So this, we started to see a lot of folks incarcerated in jail for one reason or another. Um, and we also know everybody in this room is quite well aware of the criminalization of mental illness, right? And so what we started to see was uh, that we needed to help these folks as well. So we made outreach, um, well, at the local level, they made outreach to their local jails and are now um, intercepting, before these folks are, dis are uh, released from jail, intercepting with this program to set them up with the recovery supports that they need to be able to have tenure and recovery within their community. So again, hospitalization, CSU states, and system involvement weight because they have to have significant mental illness diagnosis and they're already involved in the criminal justice system. Any questions so far on eligibility before I move forward? So a requirement of this program is to participate in the program is systems collaboration. So at the local level, we need to see that communities are working together and are asking all these folks to the table to participate in this because what we're doing is we're developing wraparound services for an adult and it's money that follows this adult. So in most communities, you're going to see folks either using collaboratives that have already been designed, like stepping up communities. Um, they're utilizing their stepping up initiatives and collaborations to piggyback this program off of it or they've built their own access to wellness collaboratives uh, within their communities. And these are the folks that you're gonna see represented on those collaborations. 
all the way from NAMI, uh, reentry coalitions, day service providers, guardianship boards, and individuals, developmental disabilities, county boards, agencies of aging, veterans, administration, all of it. Now, this isn't always consistent. I've got some counties that have these folks every month they meet and they make sure that they're making all of those services for their community. Sometimes they bring them in as needed, depending on the client. <laughs> um, recovery supports. So the purpose of this is to provide these wraparound services in the form of recovery supports to these folks. And so recovery supports, the way we have defined it, is an assistance intended to help an individual initiate and sustain that recovery within their community. So we do this on an individual basis. I shouldn't say we, our behavioral health providers and the county boards do this on an individual basis based on clinical judgment and client need. So you're gonna see why we do that here in a second because it's not just so free for all. This list of recovery supports that I'm gonna show you is most certainly not exhaustive. Um, I think we started out with a small batch and then our county boards and providers became extremely creative in how they've been able to support the folks within their communities. Um, so this is not intended to be a restrictive list of recovery supports, but just a balance of, uh, here are some ideas to think about that typically lends to more ideas if they go along. So we do have a per client cost that renews at the beginning of every new fiscal year. So we had a limited to $8,000 per person. Now, a lot of folks might not use all $8,000. There are some folks that need to go over that $8,000. And so there's some flexibility there at the provider and board level to determine how they're gonna manage their allocation with the folks that they serve in their community. Before using access to wellness funds, though, they need to utilize all other local, state, and federal dollars that are already in existence to serve those folks, with the exception of levy funds. We have some really generous communities in Ohio that if we were to say you have to utilize all of your levy funds, they're never going to tap into access to wellness. So we allow for those levy funds to be on the side. You can't grade these. So in the communities, we've seen folks that say, you know, we have this program that only allows this many dollars to help this person in this capacity. Can we braid access to wellness with that? And you absolutely can. So um, one example is access to success. It is a program for folks that are coming out of one of our regional psychiatric hospitals and back into the community. So we can braid those two together. So when access to success dollars are spent, we can come in with access to wellness. It's a lot of access, right? So we do have access to wellness. Sometimes I get confused when I speak, but not today. Um, and we can write those two together. These are some examples of those funding opportunities and recovery supports that I was talking about. I know it's a lot of type on this one slide, and we can add more if we want to, but um, we see everything from, hey, I need help getting my ID. I just got out of jail. I need help getting my ID. And, or um, getting uh, the payment to do a licensure application because I want to be a barber again and I need help moving in that direction. Um, parenting classes and life skills, guardianship fees. We see a lot of funds spent with emergency basic need items and food, clothing, cleaning, hygiene, prepaid phone and minutes. The way it is right now is we all know that internet is a utility these days, a basic utility that folks need to have. Um, as well as gas, water, electric. We'll also pay arrears. So if an individual is seeing they're living in maybe on their own in their apartment and they've got bills that have stacked up, their electricity's gonna be turned off, their water's gonna be turned off, we can help them with that and pay those arrears, especially when they don't have any other option uh, to, to pay for that. Bus passes, assessment, specialized services, um, medication alerts, all the way to provider program staff for access to wellness program and 10% indirect. So we expanded this over the last year or so to include, because we're looking at sustainability of the program over time. And so we want to make sure that communities have what they need and providers have what they need to sustain this long term. So we started to open this up to provider staff at the behavioral health provider, 
can't hire folks or do rating time of a person's uh, position when they work directly within the Access to Wellness program. So we've seen this used in a ton of different ways. Um, folks within the behavioral health providers have gone all the way to hiring folks that are just Access to Wellness dedicated staff. Um, we've seen boards and providers split the cost of somebody and they um, do the outreach within the community, get everybody together at the, around the table and provide those recovery supports. Um, maybe this individual is paid half by the hospital, half by access to wellness funds to do that linkage for folks who are in the ER. Um, we've seen that recently in Franklin County, which I think is quite innovative. And then the 10% indirect, this is a heavy lift, I'm not gonna lie. So this is a bit of a heavy lift administratively. So what we wanted to do was support those folks on the back end. They're doing all the processing of those reports, all the processing of those checks and the money and moving it around and make sure that folks get what they need. So now we provide that 10% indirect to those providers so they can help support their staff in this person. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what we're looking at here, because I think it's important that you all see the uh, where we are with this program what it's doing for the communities so like i mentioned before we have 45 county uh, hs boards participating in fiscal year 23 alone just the last one we served 1578 individuals the year before that they only served 400. so we've served almost two thousand dollars two thousand dollars two thousand people um, within one fiscal uh, state fiscal year the majority of those individuals served were involved in three systems. So um, uh, the county boards send in a report every six months. And from that, we're able to see how many folks identified with criminal justice, how many folks identified with aging, and so forth, the systems. So we know that the majority of folks in this order uh, are homeless, involved in criminal justice, and or jail incarceration. After receiving help from an access to wellness program, this is within fiscal year 23, the last year, 81% of folks did not experience another inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, 90 did not experience incarceration or reincarceration, and 96% did not experience a crisis stabilization unit stay. So we know that providing these recovery supports to these folks in the community and supporting them in that space is doing some good. And this, I just wanted to give you a, a, a breakdown of how, so you can see, so we served 563 folks within criminal justice systems, uh, 58 within outpatient health and restoration, and so forth. It is worth noting, though, that because an individual can be linked to multiple systems, some of these might be duplicative. So you might have somebody who is homeless and also a veteran and also aging, right? So it just depends on, on how they present to the county board and their providers. Uh, over uh, the last year, we spent about $3.1 million on recovery supports for these folks in various uh, capacities. And the majority of funding was utilized for these top three housing. And we'll break that down a little bit more on what that means. Emergency basic need items and transportation was a big one. That also, not just gas cards and bus passes, sometimes that means Uber, especially in rural communities where they don't have access to frequent transportation, they might have to take Uber. So this is the housing breakdown. So 67% of those folks that received housing as a recovery support received permanent housing. So independent living in an apartment, a single family home, uh, 42 had permanent supportive housing, recovery housing, we have 62% transitional time limit housing. This is utilized a lot because as you all know, housing is an issue for everybody. <laughs> so there's just not enough to go around. So we see a lot of folks utilizing the access to wellness funds for these hotel stays until more permanent stable housing can be obtained. And in um, a lot of those cases, we have the providers really involved. So that way there's more stability for that individual while they're in this flux. So um, there's a program that provides uh, folks for crisis intervention, specifically for access to wellness clients, to help them maintain that stability in their community until they can uh, become more independent. 
And then 69% of that, of that funding was used for ground and security deposits. So, any questions so far before we get to success stories? And don't worry, folks on the phone, I'm going to read these to you just for accessibility purposes and kind of give a synopsis. Um, no so, I wanted to give you guys a couple of success stories. These are my favorite parts of this program. We share these with the group once a month when we get together and talk about success stories. It's important that we see how this program is affecting people's lives positively. So, um, in this success story, a 66 year old individual, long history of inpatient psychiatric hospitalization at different psychiatric hospitals, both private and regional and involved with the criminal justice system. Uh, they were homeless, they were not engaged with their treatment and care. And during their last inpatient hospitalization, they were placed on a long-acting injectable to help them uh, manage their symptoms. So this individual began working with case managers and then through the case managers building rapport, was referred to an access to wellness program in the community. So this uh, individual now has their own apartment um, talks proudly about having their own place to live, is happy to share that they had no further inpatient hospitalizations, no arrests, and no further involvement with the criminal justice system, and they are actively engaged with their treatment. So this is an individual that got linked up in fiscal year 23 and is still doing really well. Um, e is an older gentleman that has spent the last few years in and out of jails and psychiatric units. Um, he was within a homeless shelter, and that employee at the homeless shelter was able to build his trust and started to link him with mental health services within his community. Uh, he's now stabilized um, and was awarded Social Security and completed his SUD program. And so now he's in his own apartment, doing rather well. He's maintained sobriety for the past six months. He's retained his housing for the past three months and access to wellness funds were used for hygiene, clothing, security deposits, and furniture for his new apartment. This one is, is very cool, so I'm excited to see you this. I shared this with this one earlier. <laughs> this individual was, recent, was hospitalized in one of our regional psychiatric hospitals um, for competency restoration um, and was stabilized and placed on an outpatient assist, assisted outpatient treatment program um, due to uh, his mental health symptoms, he had removed all of the plumbing, electrical work, and so forth within his home. So the home uh, became un unlivable. Um, so he had left his home and was living on the property of an abandoned restaurant at the time. So during his time with probate court, he was gifted a violin. He began playing his music daily outside a local drugstore, and he was earning money and got a higher quality violin as time went on. So each time he came to court, he played uh, for the court, for the judge, um, and the, the provider and ward said that they were blown away. So he's self-taught. So with access to wellness funds, he was able to secure an apartment, purchase all the items he needed before moving in, he recently graduated from his assistant outpatient treatment program, and the judge has made arrangements for him to play his violin in the atrium of the courthouse. He also has a big following on the social media app, TikTok for now. Um, and he's also bought himself a guitar and a cello and has taught himself how to play those things as well. So really cool things that have come from this. Um, this is the website I was mentioning earlier. Uh, you'll have that available. Again, it's just a quick search on the department's website. And then my contact information, if you should need to contact me, email probably the best. Um, so any questions about the program? The, the one question I did have, and it's not a question I've had in this program, um, and it's not a negative comment, it's just there's, I know there's more money, there's more money available that, did not get spent. It rolls over into the next business. That's nice. <laughs> so how do we, how do we, and I'm saying we in County, Ohio, yeah. with our affiliates and with the boards and yeah. providers, yeah. get this out of folks? Because, you know, I'll be honest with you, we prefer 100 providers, yeah. and whether it's group homes or others, to say, who's the access to one person or neighbor? In some cases, like, they've got the full 8,000 mm -hmm. to, to house somebody 
who, <coughs> quite frankly, is unhousable. And I mean that in the sense that they use the 8,000 to hire a case manager 24-7. Yep. So that person wouldn't go back to the hospital. It's a heck of a lot cheaper. Yep. And again, um, I know we get more love from the sheriffs around the state who use this money to keep people from coming back. And their numbers prove it. I know Justice Stratton always, she's, she's your player. Well, she's the second-ranked champion. Um, <laughs> but, but she's always like, these things work because it reduces recidivism, whether they're coming out of the state hospital, yeah. uh, OBRC, we just had them in the center on the board. Their biggest challenge is the reentry piece. And we argue the biggest challenge with inpatient is when they, are, when they come out, how do we make sure they don't fall? Absolutely. And this is perfect for that. Absolutely. So here's a couple things. One of the things that we've been working on is working with the hospitals on the discharge planning piece, right? We have to improve the communication between the hospitals, both psychiatric, like both private and regional, to make sure that this program is getting there, right? And so that's an active part that I've been doing with my colleagues at the department. Another thing that we're doing is outreach. So I've uh, picked up my, I feel like I'm on a tour. So, um, <laughs> but, right, it's my access wellness tour. Um, but one of the things is that um, outreach to DODD and the county boards, talking at their conferences about this program, getting the word out, coming and talking to you all, um, sitting in on iTeams in communities across the state, um, talking with agent, uh, aging organizations. So this is a big part of bridging that gap. I think is breaking those silos is the most important thing for this program to be successful. Um, much like stepping up and having all those folks at the table. It comes down to education. So yeah, and communication about it. So we've seen an improvement, I will say that, because the numbers, when we look at the system involvement of folks, we've seen an increase in DD, aging, and veterans, just within the last six months. So we know something is working, the outreach is working. So keep it up. Thanks, fans. <laughs> Anything else? And, yeah. I'm uh, from an area agency on aging, also uh, from the part of the state that's very white um, <laughs> on your map. Yeah. Um, how can I impact my local county board to look at this? I, I made a note to call. I know the three counties that are served by one board. Sure. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I tell people is feel free to share this information with them. I am happy to talk to you forever. Okay. I will talk. I will preach this program. We'll do it. But I've, um, in one county, I provided a presentation uh, to all of their providers, and they're like, we got to take this back to the board. This is what we want. This is what we want to see. Um, so I'm happy to do any of that and help provide that education. Um, okay. Just got to add me in there. And I'll support it from the local level because this is huge to me. Yeah, huge. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to support you all in any capacity. It does come down to the board decision as to whether or not they want to take something like that on. Um, now, one thing I will tell you is that if a, um, a county board decides to take it on and wants to participate, there we don't just throw them in the deep end. I'll meet with them, provide technical assistance. I talk with these county boards almost daily because they have ideas. Hey, can we use it for this? Hey, let's, what about this? Hey, let's, can we do this? Can we go over the $8,000, right? So it's it's not just they're going into the deep end by themselves. There's a lot of collaboration. Also, we meet monthly. So we've got about 60 to 80 folks that meet at 8 a.m. on the first Thursday of every month. I know 8 a.m. to me is normally the best thing. But when we meet, we have an opportunity to hear from one another. They share their success stories. They ask each other questions. So it's they're not without support. I will say that. Okay. 100%. I'll be uh, getting that much fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I always like to say, because we had a hard time getting jails to ask for the reimbursement for psychotropic drugs. I mean, free money, folks. Mm -hmm. Free money. But, and the longer we've worked with this program, the, the less restrictive they become on what you can spend it on. So you tell your board, you talk to your commissioners, and you say, your commissioners, if you're not doing this, you are leaving money on the table. And so that's where you go, you go to your commissioners and have to pay these things. Great advocacy. <laughs> 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 Anything else for you all? And you'll have these slides, so, and then you, if you have any questions after this, 
do not hesitate to call me or uh, contact me. Okay. Oh, yeah. I forgot how you going to set about the uh, psych routes being able to come out of Can that meds come out of it also? Those meds don't come out of this program. That's a separate program mm -hmm. from the Department of Mental Health Foundation. So oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, it's for psychotropic drugs and now MAT in jails. In the yes. And you can believe how hard it was to get some of the jails to ask for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We still have a few that have it. Except to one day. Down to what? Oh, it's all for, for psychotropic meds. We're up to, I think, 50, 51, something like that, jails for MAT and meds. Okay. Oh, Mostly wow. Vivitrol, but we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you.